sorry for taking so much time. I, okay, no I, 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 I know. Uh, t I try anyway. I, I, I do not so much uh, stick to my paper, so I uh, maybe I can a little bit um, uh, be shorter on my presentation. So uh, you still see it, okay? Everything is fine. Yeah. Yeah. So right. so that is the outline of my paper, and um, I will especially. Uh, focus on the chips from the field where I give some examples from our interviews and from our research and I will skip more on the third part that is more on a, a theoretical and methodological um, uh, reflections. So I start with my preliminary remarks and I just have to repeat what I had written uh, when I was invited to contribute. Um, I felt very much honored by this invitation, uh, but uh, I was a little bit uh, hesitant to respond in the affirmative because uh, uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, it is not my field uh, what has been outlined by the research program. Um, and I quote from the, from the website, the research program got a focus on religious communities in different contexts, investigating their potential to foster development, equality, social cohesion, and ecological uh, sustainability. Well, my expertise concerning this matter, if I've got any expertise in this at all, is merely based on some interdisciplinary research projects that I had carried out with colleagues from the practical theology and from the social sciences. And these projects were not on religious communities in a hardcore sense. Rather, we were interested in what we refer to as religious hybrids, that is phenomena and performative cultures, or in sociological terms, scenes which with affinity, equivalence, or sometimes even explicit connotation to religion, religion in the broadest meaning of the word. Among these phenomena, we found a variety of forms of post-traditional community formation, including so-called intentional communities of different size and setup that are exploring new ways of life. And along the line, of our research projects, my paper does not so much deal with the greening of religion, that is the growing importance of e ecological issues and sustainability in religious communities. Rather, my focus is uh, what I would call the spiritualization or the religionization, sorry for this artificial word, uh, of discourses and performances related to sustainability among some of those intentional communities that quite often and explicitly do consider themselves not religious. Um, as I have also written in my paper, the presentation is based on, uh, on a series of research that we have done. And so the paper is in a way implicitly also co-authored by my colleagues uh, that were involved in the research and also indeed um, by our research fellows. Um, if you are uh, interested in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the results, we have published some of these aspects in a book uh, on uh, uh, called, uh, called Spiritualität. Um, so much for the commercial break, so to say. Well, what I would present now are some um, some examples of interviews, but to introduce the field, especially for those who, who, who do not know much about uh, um, uh, Germany and this area, um, the field, uh, the research has been carried out in uh, Mecklenburg, uh, West Pomerania in the Northeast of uh, uh, Germany, in this uh, dark green uh, uh, map. Now, here more detailed, you can see that it's uh, on the seaside, on the Baltic Sea. Um, and what also should be said, it's a very rural area with um, only some major cities, but not. Uh, it's not a metropolitan area. Now, what we had done in our research was not only to look into, um, into fields of organic farming, 
uh, but also into the field of um, art galleries and into the field of healers, that is alternative healers, including spiritual healing and so on, to trace forms of what we called religious hybridity. Uh, here, a map that has been produced by our research fellows, the green bubbles are the uh, oceanic farmers that uh, were, uh, that we identified. Uh, it's both farms, farm units, um, individual uh, groups, and so on and so forth. Then the blue bubbles are artists and art galleries, and the orange bubbles are these uh, alternative healers that are not of interest to us. Once again, the actors identified in the field of uh, oceanic farming, uh, the map is in a way comprehensive, but not at all exhaustive. I had mentioned it some, somewhere in my paper that we had, uh, that there are more than 800 um, uh, oceanic farming units. And uh, we focused on about, or we identified about 100 farms, oceanic uh, 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 oceanic nurseries, uh, market gardens, and so on and so forth that we recorded and surveyed in more detail. What also was important for us was to look into networks, into the networking, because it, it has turned out that this is a very important aspect of uh, identifying these religious networks, this networking that takes place. For instance, in the very northeastern part, uh, we had identified a very complex network that was a very interesting field uh, for us. Um, now, I give some examples of, uh, of uh, from our interview material, and I will also uh, yeah, 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 tag it a little bit, like the first uh, quotations I uh, I, I, I am tagging by uh, focusing on uh, the idea of a, a circular organism that is uh, explained in this, uh, in this quotation. The interviewee said, well, the aim should be a largely self-contained organism, no long ways. That's why it's nice that we have now a Solavi. Now, Solavi is the acronym for Solidarische Landwirtschaft in German, in English, community supported agriculture. That is, that uh, groups come together or people come together um, and form this Solavi, this community supported agricultural unit that is not simply profit oriented. And for us, that was also very important to look into these kind of. Uh, well, organizations, if we would like to take it in this one, in, in these terms, uh, to get uh, information. Another example that uh, takes up one word that was uh, sometimes used, um, not so often, but sometimes uh, as an alternative, we had uh, felt to religion. I'm all, I all, I've always heard that there is something like that the transcendent dimension. So the vocabulary used by anthroposophy was not completely strange for me. And I wasn't appalled by any spiritual stories or anything, no. However, even today, we don't call ourselves anthropologists anyhow, right? So we comply with the guidelines of the eco-label Demeter. I will say something about that later. And we listen complacently. And uh, let me tell you, we sympathize with a lot of arguments. My main argument is simply this spiritual component and this concept of the whole. So the whole as well, non-material things, that suits me. So I am a spiritual person. Maybe I should mention here that in the quotations I have uh, selected for this presentation, very often is reference done to Demeter, to anthropology, uh, uh, sorry, uh, anthroposophy and the anthroposophical tradition in, um, uh, of, uh, of Steiner. Um, this is quite often referenced, but this does not mean that those people interviewed are really uh, in, the, in the hardcore and uh, anthroposophical field. Uh, it's simply that there are some very unspecific um, uh, relationships, but um, it's, it's not that all the interviewers are really inside the realm of anthroposophy. 
Another interview shows uh, sympathy for the principle of a holistic approach in biodynamic agriculture. Well, um, and the interviewer says, uh, it hasn't got this narrow approach of a faith. Rather, it's got simply many things that are very practical, be it in medicine, in education, or in agriculture, or, or, or in the arts. And I got to know that, anthroposophy, in GDR times. And there was that again, uh, of course, also a, a kind of escape and an idea of safety because you were among yourself a kind of community. He refers to the anthroposophical Christian Gemeinschaft, that Christian community. And I grew up near, he calls an Eastern German city, and there's the Christian community and there we've met. So I'm not baptized in any way or anything else. So now from, so now I'm not from the religious side. I'm not a member either, but the people I met there also uh, lived in real life. And as I said, I didn't understand Steiner's thoughts at all at the beginning, I have to say. Only when I did my farming here, it dawned on me. Oh, that's a big white heaven. No, that's a universe. And interesting, the same person um, mentions uh, something totally different that shows that he um, builds a bricolage of a worldview for which uh, the anthroposophical aspect is only one. He continues and says, well, that's, that's one side of mine, of what I do. And the other side is the anarchy. So I was already interested in anarchists here in the GDR area, in Erich Mühsam and Bakunin and whatsoever, and whatever their names are, or Oskar Maria Graf. And uh, yes, that was uh, the other side, the more idealistic, or how should I say, the opposite of the anthroposophists, if you take it seriously. But actually, they fit together quite well. So that's my direction where I am from. Another interview, we mentioned a strong connection between ecology, community, and commonality in with this difference. What does ecology mean? How do we, the, we as the members of a major farming unit, how do we use the term today? Mostly, it refers to respect for the environment, for nature. Environment and nature both are primarily imagined as materially and spatially. But there's also a temporal dimension, a respect for established values, for good tradition. Previously, this respect used to be more important and, of course, religious. What we practice is, in a way, ultimately an ecological attitude towards the deceased. And of course, when we hear these keywords, we think of our children and grandchildren as responsibility for the future is a big issue. The respect for the reality of the unborn brings about a great openness. That's what I consider the most noble and probably also consciously religious attitude. Now, this is only a small um, uh, part of examples. Well, I, I take uh, this, uh, this, maybe I take this uh, also. Uh, where some reference is made to religion. Well, as to religion, I've got a bit of a mixed feeling, if only about the word itself, because I somehow, well, I was never particularly religious. I'm still registered as a Protestant and basically grew up with these values. Spiritual fits it probably better. So it's already the case that I, of course, give thought to things like in the context of beginning of life, end of life, what actually is health, what is life, or what do we do in a way that makes sense. And this is definitely related to the values I am pursuing here, so to speak. And I also see this in what we are doing here. And I'm also not particularly anthroposophically oriented. For me, there is automatically certain, there are automatically certain values, intersections between organic farming and anthroposophy which I would accept without protest, yet somehow, like in the case of religion, without being part of this ritual-ridden everyday life and without knowing much about it. 
Well, these are some uh, Im uh, some impressions of our material. It's only a small part, but I think it gives you a rough idea of uh, how people talk about um, um, about uh, organic farming, about aspects that are for them in the focus of sustainability, so to say. Now, some historical trajectories uh, about this development. Uh, I do not want it to go into any detail, um, but I will give you a rough, uh, um, a rough overview. Um, the problem in this field is that we have here a little bit a blurred um, uh, nomenclature. On the one hand, the generic term is organic farming in German ecological Landbau, and that is also used as a term in German uh, that refers to uh, biologisch organische Landwirtschaft. Now, uh, the second, uh, the, 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 uh, and different from that, the second tradition is called biodynamic agriculture or in German biologisch dynamische Landwirtschaft. So these are the two major uh, traditions and the two major uh, strains of, um, um, uh, of this tradition of organic, far organic farming in, in Germany. Well, uh, in, in, in English, it's a little bit different uh, because you have, uh, you have different um, uh, terms that are more, more prevalent than in German, but I do not want to go into the detail. Maybe we can discuss about that later. Um, as to organic farming, the difference between biodynamic and bio-organic uh, agriculture dates back to a time before Rudolf Steiner, who is considered as the founder, the, the founding father of uh, biodynamic agriculture, though um, the term was introduced only later. Um, and um, we have a clear differentiation between organic farming and biodynamic agriculture in Germany. But if you look in it into detail, we see that uh, there are common roots, and these common roots can be traced back to the 19th century, for example, it's only one example, the naturalist, eugenicist, philosopher, physician, and biologist Ernst Haeckel had established ecology as a key co concept and with it had paved the way for the later nomenclature of the respective academic discipline. But in his oeuvre, he links sciences, ethics, ideas of progress, evolutionism, and free thought, Freitdenkertum in German, thus occasionally crossing the boundaries between science and philosophy of life or between science and ideology. Usually, the, uh, the origin of organic farming is linked to Ewald Koenemann as one of the founding fathers of organic farming that he had termed natural farming, natürliche Landbau, uh, in, con in contrast to um, the biodynamic agriculture that emerged from Rudolf Steiner's teaching. Pioneers, the two pioneers in this field uh, were linked to cultural, social, and ideological movements that featured at that moment. Uh, Kohnemann more to the life reform movement and Steiner more to uh, the movement that he founded himself, anthropology. Um, but uh, accordingly, life reform movement and anthropology, uh, these two movements of the 1920s are considered the two roots of the environmental movement generally and of organic farming uh, specifically. Now, um, to difference sorry, to differentiate these two things, we can uh, distinguish um, um, uh, uh, organic farming on the one hand and a biodynamic um, agriculture on the other hand. And this is also reflected in, um, in two different eco-labels that are awarded. Uh, there are other uh, eco-labels, but I take out these two because they are also important for understanding uh, the um, commitment of the groups who uh, relate to these, uh, these uh, eco-labels. Um, now, what is interesting, though, is that um, um, while uh, Demeter is considered to more 
linked to esoteric traditions. It is interesting to see that uh, in the public uh, presentation and on its website, uh, uh, Demeter does not uh, refer to uh, esoteric or ideological dimensions. Uh, you can see that even if you look at the, if the, the symbols that are also symbols that they would share with normal traditions of uh, uh, organic farming. Nevertheless, there are, um, there is, a, how should I call it? There is, there are some crossovers and there are uh, some, um, some phenomena that link more to the field of spirituality and in fact, to religion. Now, um, as to the chapter on reflections and considerations, I will skip my manuscript mainly, uh, outline just the most important aspects. One of the aspects is the term um, that we used, namely a religious hybridity or religious hybrid phenomena. Um, the context of discovery is the area where we did our research, the former GDR, an area that is highly de-religionized, that is post-communist, that is post-Protestant, but in a way that was our, our hypothesis. It is also post-secular, and we may find new traces that are somehow, howsoever, related to religion. And that is why we used religious hybridity um, uh, as, um, as, a, as, a, as, as a term uh, in or to, to map out patterns of individual meaning, but also to map out the logic of a jointly shared performative practice um, without presupposing a consistent positive religions, because we, we wanted to avoid uh, to, to insinuate religion somewhere where it maybe was not at all. Religious hybridity was also used as a search term for us. So it uh, has in a heuristic function uh, been used by us as a descriptive term for the reconstruction of ambivalences and ambivalent phenomena between culture and religion. So it's not an analytical term, it is a search term. Next to, um, next to uh, religious hybridity, um, the uh, community formation and symbolically charged agriculture were very important fields for our research. Um, we uh, saw that hybrid forms of religion materialized in different communities and groups and associations and networks and so on and so forth. So that one uh, area of interest was the way how, communi how community formation takes place. And on the other hand, what was interesting for us is that agricultural products and production methods were symbolically charged with dimensions beyond everyday routine or beyond the materially tangible. Um, that was, that is not the case with all products, but that was very widespread. And that was an area that we uh, discovered and into which we researched later. Um, the term, the large religious field uh, was for us very important also for our uh, analytical purposes. Now, next to the term large religious field, also, the term market of singularities became important. What do we, uh, what, what, what is about these terms and what has that got to do with religious hybrids? Now, um, it was very helpful for us to conceptualize the category of religious hybridity in sociological terms. For this, we used the term derived from Pierre Bourdieu, uh, who talked about the larger religious field. Um, to which the area of the interface of religion and organic farming is also attributed. And what was for us also important was the, um, the, the discovery that the larger religious field is constituted and organized as a social practice by means of market-shaped network-like community formations and what 
uh, Lucien Tapic, the French sociologist and uh, economist, called markets of singularities. Again, I do not want to go into the details of these com comparatively uh, complex and complicated uh, theories. Um, maybe the, it is enough to outline that uh, the following idea. These singular products, uh, these unique products, require um, an authentication and an validation, both internally and externally. And what is needed for these um, singular or unique products and processes is, on the one hand, something like faith or trust or confidence and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, something more harder like uh, a certification by, for instance, eco uh, levels or by membership in diverse associations. So that is more the sociological and um, institutional background. But for our purposes, it was more important and is more important to look uh, into, um, sorry, I skipped this, um, to look into, um, um, uh, into the fact that uh, standards of organic farming exist beyond certificates and beyond institutes. They exist as discourses. And as these causes, they are connected to ideological concepts beyond the idea of pure organic farming, and they constitute or motivate an ethics of responsibility for life and world in different contexts with particularly different complexity. Now, um, to make it more concrete, you can purchase an organic potato, for example, only for nutrition purposes. It's healthy food, that's all. But you can also see it as a symbol of a concept of meaning in life. And that is what interests us. And that is where we went uh, very deeply into our research. Now, next to this, uh, products and unique products and unique uh, processes, what was important was networking. I take here the example of, uh, of, a, of a minor and a, a larger level of this networking that gives you an idea um, why this is important for us when we look uh, to areas where uh, religion is generated, I would uh, simply take it. You have here a, a major farming unit in its internal relations and networking. And here you can see even inside this farming unit, you have some developments that are open to a transcendent or if you like, would like to say spiritual or religious dimension. Um, there's also an institutional connection because the Waldorf Schule, that is an institution that comes from the tradition of anthroposophy, is, uh, uh, is, on, the, is on, the, uh, on the compound of this unit farm, but institutionally uh, it is, so to say, outside and linked to the Waldorf Schule outside the compound. Now, if we look uh, at the external uh, relations of this farming unit and on its networking, it is now very interesting to see this extreme complexity. We have on the one hand, a relationship to these uh, membership associations and to the eco levels, that is here Demeter in this case, but we have also relationships to institutions, to organizations, to different agencies and actors that have got nothing to do uh, with, uh, uh, with, um, um, with this, uh, how should I say, uh, spiritually uh, charged uh, dimension. On the one hand, on the other hand, you have a relationship to hardcore religion, like here, to um, to um, uh, to the to the parish in in, in the uh, in the vicinity or to a pastor who is very much engaged, and you see this is was important for us to detect um, um, a, a field where um, religion in the broadest sense of the word and what we refer to religious hybridity, where hybrid religious phenomena are produced. 
Now, um, the networking is important because it shows uh, this kind of networking is not restricted to simply functional matters of production or marketing or, 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 or sales and coordination of distribution change, but it includes a value-based dimension. And that is where we started and uh, tried to discover these religious hybrids. Now I come to my conclusion. Uh, the fuzzy bounders of the secular and the auratic dimension of sustainability. Now in the uh, larger religious field, we could trace interrelations between organic farming and ecological thinking on the one hand and spirituality in the broadest sense uh, on the other. Um, I would prefer nevertheless to use here the term religious hybrids because even some of our interview interviewees were very reluctant to use the term spirituality because they did not consider themselves uh, as spiritual or and they didn't want to have to do anything with religion at all. But nevertheless, you could see that there is this auratic quality that they time and again um, uh, mentioned in their uh, in the interviews. Now, um, the overarching aim and idea that we could trace in many of the interviews was the idea and the aim to integrate man and environment into a self-contained entity by implementing practices of responsible stewardship towards the world. So this responsi uh, responsible uh, stewardship um, uh, ref was referred to as production and consumption of healthy goods. And this production consumption of healthy goods advances to a means for the sake of sustaining the world. What unites these individual agents, the farming units and the communities under consideration is a jointly shared belief or a practical sense in the words of uh, Bourdieu that is evident in product related practices and corresponds to what Bourdieu has referred to as illusio. For those involved in, net in, involved in networks of organic farming, in the larger religious field. And against the background of similarly perceived experiences, meaning is generated by means of specific practices that aim at the recovery and the preservation of the world, accompanied by processes of an auratization of the world generally. So the aura is not only about products and products production processes, but it spreads and spreads. So the whole world becomes in a way our, uh, uh, auratic. I think that the findings are um, a little bit different from what concepts like dark green religion, for example, and similar models of eco-spirituality put forward. Um, what we can observe in our case is not so much uh, what in the green uh, in the dark green religion uh, tradition is considered as uh, as uh, in, in which nature is considered to be sacred imbued by intrinsic value and worthy of uh, reverent care rather it is the above mentioned practical sense, that is this term uh, uh, taken up from Bourdieu, that a certain aura is attributed to specific goods, services, production processes, etc. And this content condenses to a kind of religious aura of sustainability. This is not to say that there are no processes which could be considered religiously generative in the sense of generating religion. On the contrary, that is the point I want to make. To me, processes of 
our organization form one, perhaps one of the most important aspects of this development and thus of gender activity with regard to religion. Maybe um, we could find a compromise between this uh, tradition of dark green religion on the one hand and uh, by what I refer to as religionization of sustainability uh, by postulating the practices of organic farming due to their character of being vested in a belief or a practical sense or a generative potential of promoting the emergence and enhancement of the religious hybrid field on the one hand. On the other hand, this gives new momentum for an advanced understanding of sustainability that avoids being narrowed down uh, to dimensions of agricultural production or ecology only. Against this background, as much as the greening of religion makes religious communities become keenly involved in collective and individual actions in the area of sustainability, processes of religious hybrid auratization may contribute to a deeper and broader understanding of sustainability, enhancing approaches focusing on rather pragmatic and functional aspects towards more complex and comprehensive strategies. So thank you very much for your patience and sorry once again for the trouble at the beginning of uh, the presentation. Thank you very much.